OK, uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is not my first time in Brazil, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Eduardo Silva. Uh, I'm, I'm from Chile, but actually live in Costa Rica. And I work for this company, which is called ARM. It used to be called Treasure Data, but we were acquired by ARM. And the goal of this talk today is to, is to give a mix. Can you hear me? It got disconnected, right? The sound now better? No, it's better. OK, if you cannot hear me, just let me know. So uh, what's the goal of this presentation? In, because you can say that login, stream processing, edge, but we are in a Linux developers conference. So here is uh, the, the, main, the main topic. When we talk about Linux, we think about the system. But the system has the kernel, libraries, and we have system services. And everything that is related with system services, most of them is about how do we handle data? How do we take data and move the data? Because login is not fun. It's not fancy. It's boring, actually. Nobody say, hey, I'm going to use syslog. Woo. No, nobody like it. Nobody like it. No, it disconnected again. Let me use this one. No worries. OK. So no, nobody likes is thinks about syslog or syslog like a big thing, because that is something that is running. And honestly, you don't care about it, right? Nobody said, I'm going to tune our syslog or syslog or whatever. But uh, this is a, a really important topic. And what I'm going to discuss here is pretty new in terms of data management and how do we handle that in services. As I said, my name is Eduardo. I'm a principal engineer at ARM. And one of the maintainers of this project, which is called Fluent Web, which is part of the family of FluentD. Both projects are fully open source and part, uh, well, are from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, or Linux Foundation, and both under the Apache license version 2. So Linux and login. Uh, when we talk about login, we talk about a specific tooling, or we think about syslog, or syslog, or systemd, and journaldd. That's how we think about this from a tooling perspective. Now, if we go to, if we think about how this is deployed in different kind of scenarios, like containerizing environments, we have some kind of runtime for containers, and those containers need to, hand, need to have some way to handle logging. For example, in Docker, if you have your Docker engine, you can handle logging with your JSON log files, or through syslog, or through journal D, or many interfaces. Or Cryo is pretty much similar, but just support journal D. So the thing is that if you think about logging, it's just a way to communicate a message to some endpoint. It's no more than that. But there's, it's pretty complex, because at the end, you don't care about the message. What you really want to do is data analysis. right? But if your messages are coming from thousands of applications, or hundreds of containers, how do you perform data analysis? You cannot do, go into each container or each Kubernetes node, get into it, or do cut, grab pipe, or whatever, over those, those logs to get some insights from your data. So what you do is, for example, every hardware or software ships some event, you send that event, you aggregate that information in a database, so then you can do data analysis. And this becomes complex, because different software, different hardware, and you need to try to put some kind of uh, middleware or tooling that can handle, for example, data formats or how the, the data is being flowing. Because sometimes we use some service like syslog. Sometimes the data comes from GCP, UDP, or any kind of fancy protocol. So how do we achieve to consume or get all this information back in one place so we can do data analysis? And this is one of the problems. We can consider, for example, that where the data is being generated, it's called the edge. Where we concentrate the data, likely, is the cloud, unless you have your, your own small environment. But usually in production, on what we see with different uh, big users and, well, uh, cloud providers, they concentrate all your data in the cloud so you can do the data analysis. 
And one of the patterns that is changing is how do we can do this analysis on the edge? But there's some challenges. Because there's one point where we can say, OK, we can consider that the edge includes the source of data, your data, and the tooling that was getting that data and doing this kind of preprocessing. So then this data is shipped out to the cloud. And data analysis uh, takes time, because we have to collect the data, filter the data, aggregate the data. And if you are familiar with databases, Data indexing is what really takes time. If you ingest a new record in the database, that record needs to be indexed so you can perform queries properly over, the, over that. And then you can do data analysis. And that takes time. It's really time consuming, and we're going to show you that at the moment. So can we do it faster? If we think about uh, the workflow that we have, what we really care about are two things. You know, get faster insights from our data, from our services, from our containers, but also do it in a lightweight mode. Because everybody can say, hey, deploy Kafka and aggregate all these messages from your containers into Kafka. OK, but Kafka needs a JVM, maybe in a couple of brokers. It's not something you're going to deploy in your laptop, right, for production. That is not usually how it works, so how we can make it better. If we think about the workflow that we had, we said that we have the region, the data, and how we have this kind of gateway or central processor that is sending the data. So maybe we can take advantage of that tooling and add all the esteroids that we need on that specific place. Because log processor collects preprocessed data and dispatch data to a central database for analysis. But what about if we do some kind of logging on esteroids? And here, I'm not, I'm not talking about to replace syslog. I'm not talking about to replace any tooling in the Linux system. I'm talking about how we can put this new tooling that connect to these services that exist on any Linux box or Linux device, but also provide some data analysis. But we do it on the edge, on the edge side, not in the cloud. So logging. If we think about how logging works, it's basically the message but that message always has some metadata. From where this data is coming from, right, the stream, this is a, like a message from a container, and the timestamp. Because in logging, there, well, in logging, there are two things. The message and the timestamp, when this message was generated. And that message sometimes gets some metadata, not just, just that. So uh, who of you is using Kubernetes, containers? Are you familiar with uh, the containers? OK. So a simple message in Kubernetes, for example, from a container from a Kubernetes pod, get all the metadata from, for Kubernetes, because we need context. A container is part of the pod. The pod resides in a node. The node is in a cluster. And that pod can have labels, annotations, and many data. OK? So one simple message that your application generate uh, it's not, it's not all. It's more than that. So this is where this project, which is open source called Fluentbit, gets in. So Fluentbit is an open source project that is basically based on the design of a simple pipeline, where it considers that you have data that come from an input, you parse the data, you filter the data, you buffer the data, because you don't want to lose it, and then you roll the data out to your database, cloud, cloud services, or anything. And how this... Uh, provide us a lot of um, features. So Fluentbit started as a Fluentd project. It started four years ago. And it's originally started as a lightweight log processor for embedded Linux. But what happened is that after two or three years of development, the embedded market did not pay attention too much to the project. So you can say that break was dying. But no, because people from the cloud space say, hey, this is great. We're going to use it. And, well, the project has been always Apache license, too. It's fully written in C language. Uh, it started for low memory and CPU footprint. But, you know, to be honest, if you are processing thousands of lines per second, you're going to consume CPU and you're going to consume memory. But the thing is how you optimize on those scenarios. And we got a pluggable architecture because you said, I'm going to have a log processor, but I want to concentrate all my messages coming from syslog maybe from the file system, from TCP. 
All of these are input plugins. And maybe you need to send that data out to Elasticsearch, Kafka, or any kind of service. All of those are plugins too. And it has built-in security with TLS. So how this works internally in a login tool? For example, an application generates a message for us and for every computer that is a record. And that record has a timestamp and the message. The message could be a map or not. A map and meaning a lot of key values as a message or a raw message. But internally, what we do when we co collect data, process data from any kind of Linux boss, what we do is serialize all the data with message pack. Are you familiar with message pack? No. Are you familiar with JSON? OK, think of JSON, but binary. OK? So you have a lot of performance optimizations. You know, if you want to parse JSON, you need to go byte by byte to see when this map started, when it ended, what is the new key, what is the new value. And when you have some binary representation, you can jump between the data types that you have. So here is how it works. The application generates the log. The log becomes a record, and FluentBed takes care of that as in a binary representation. Those records are grouped by categories. So for example, if you're listening messages from your Apache web server host, and also from syslog, what we do is to group all these records and attach a tag to them. So you can say, and wh why we need a tag or a kind of label? Because we need to organize this data in a temporal storage for processing. And after the data is go to the processing or to the storage, it goes to the routing phase so you can send the data out, for example, to any kind of output destination. And if you can see, we have matching rules. For example, apache.start, and we have syslog. So all data based on tag, we do some routing based, based on matching. And how this operates in the cloud space? Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, we have the master API server, and we can consider that this is a node. So what we do basically is deploy Fluent Bit as a daemon set. A daemon set is a pod that runs on every node and read all the containers logs that are in the same node. That is one thing, because we get one context from the application, which is a message, timestamp, and some local information from the container. But in, in order to get more context, we need labels and annotations, and that's why the log processor has the capability to connect to the API server get the labels, annotation, and merge all that information together. That's what it does a Fluent D and Fluent Bit on Kubernetes, basically. If you see, most of the Kubernetes cluster runs either Fluent D or Fluent Bit, or any kind of other flavor of log processor. And then, once it collects the data, it sends the data to your database, which can be anything, basically. A Fluent Bit supports like a 20 outputs, I think, of plugins. 15, 20. Fluent D has like a thousand plugins made by the community, many made from Brazil too. So that is really good. So here the thing is how you connect data that is from different sources in different formats. You unify that and then ship that data out. Because as I said before, what we really care is about data analysis, and we need to concentrate the data. So uh, Fluent Bit at least is deployed 2,000 times, 200,000 times a day. So you can think that in a week we have more than a million deployments. That means that for every node that is being deployed in Kubernetes, it's deploying Fluent D and, Flu and Fluent Bit. And we have major adoption now with AWS cloud providers and Google Cloud Platform. As you can see, most of the big companies are relying on all this open source software. So how we, I, I talk about, I give a good speech about Fluent Bit and all why well, it's really good, but what, how we can get faster data analysis. If we think that all your data goes to the log collector and then ship to the database, and that's where you perform data analysis, maybe the log collector or this, this tool is where we can improve and put some extra features to perform data analysis. Are you familiar with the concept of stream processing? Kind of, maybe familiar with uh, Apache Spark, Flink, or Kafka streams, okay? So stream processing is just the ability to perform data processing while the data is still in motion. So that means as soon as you get the data and the data has not hit the database, I mean the file system, you can do data transformation. But 
what happens is that this stream processing like future is always happening in the cloud. And when I said Apache, um, Spark, Flink, or Kafka, all of them are Java stacks, right? So you need a couple of machines running on it, and that takes time. So you can get your data, your results, but sometimes it's not fast enough. So how we can do this but run it on the edge? So and doing stream processing on the edge is not uh, something that existed before. I would say that there are really small, so a few number of tools that really are doing stream processing on the edge. Because what we are aim to provide is like the ability to do data selection, filtering data, create aggregation using windows of time, or create new streams of data based on results, but inside of the same login tool before to hit the cloud. And this helps a lot of scenarios. You can consider IoT devices connected to a gateway. You can consider, for example, clusters where you don't want to ship all the data from your nodes to the database and maybe just the results of certain operations. And of course, performance. Uh, we have to be careful because when we say performance, we're talking about the time, the amount of time that we spend to, to get for some response for some results, right? Because if you're, new, you're not doing CPU computing in the cloud, you're doing it on the edge. So nothing is for free, right? So the approach is like uh, this, and these are the pains. Currently, if you want to do login, luckily you need to access the file system, get your data, you do your data parsing and wait for indexing. And this is where FluentBed 1.2, which was released like two months ago, comes in because it comes with full stream processing capabilities. We have the ability to take data and ship the data out. You can say that that is streaming data, right? But the ability to do stream processing is beyond that. For example, we're going to run uh, an example with uh, Elasticsearch. Are, are you familiar with Elasticsearch database? M most of you? OK. We're going to do the following. Just process one million of records in a log file. Every line is a JSON file. And we're going to send it to Elasticsearch. That's it. And we want to see how much time take it processing because we want to perform data analysis. Can you hear me this thing like this? Okay. Yeah. So the first thing is, uh, is to check if Elastic is up and running. OK, it's a stop there. OK, Elastic is running. So one thing to do that you should not do at home is to wipe the database just for the demo purposes. That command is really dangerous. <laughs> OK, I just write the database. Uh, and this is one, Elasticsearch is always open, right? And <laughs> see, I did this one because I'm from Chile. And this week in Chile was a leak of information because all people that vote for president and stuff, there's a huge database of Elasticsearch with all the data was just exposed because the end was open. So be careful with Elasticsearch. That's the way I wanted to talk. So OK, I just created the database. And here, in the top one, here I have one file called data.log that has a million lines. Okay? There are JSON lines with ID, time, a country name, a random word, and so on. So you can do that. This is kind of a record, a formatted record. This is local in the file system. So what I wanted to show is how much time it takes this to ingest this data into Elastic. So if I go to Fluentbed, maybe you're not too familiar, but you will get it right away. We have three main sections. The first one is a service section that say how the service operates. In it says that it's going to flush data every zero. Point two seconds. We're going to give it one second, which is like normal for log processing. Uh, I'm going to comment out this section that is for later. We have the input, meaning from where I'm going to consume my data. Tail is an input plugin to tail log files from the file system. 
I'm putting an alias to this data that will be called Linux dev. The file that I'm going to monitor, you can put uh, a wild card or anything. And the parser that will be used to interpret this data, because the data in a file is just uh, raw bytes, right? But we want to handle that like a JSON, the internally with message pack, so we need to parse that information. And what I'm going to do here is to, I'm going to match all records, and I'm going to send them to Elasticsearch. The ES is uh, Elasticsearch plugin. So every time that you put a name here, it's a plugin that you're going to use. Here in the middle, we can have filters. You can have any outputs, any inputs, whatever you want. OK? So that should be fine. And the second tab, we're going to query the index of Elastic. So every one second, I'm putting the elastic index and I'm going to add minuses. So every second, I'm putting the elastic search index on this tab. And in the other tab, I'm going to run QMF and start ingesting data. As you can see, there is a number that is growing in docs.com. That is a number of documents of records that are being processed by Fluentbay and being ingested in Elasticsearch. Okay, right now you're seeing Elasticsearch. Do you remember how many records we have? A million. Oh, yeah, 1,000. This is scary. Fluentbay is running. I don't know what's going on here, but if I run a query again from the command line, it's stuck. The database is stuck at the moment. So, why did I learn from me? Oh, the database is down. That should not happen. Happen that everything in computing, for any kind of service, or network as you the system, everything is about battery. How much data you take, how much data you process, how much data do you ingest? On this case, I'm ingesting all the data that I can and sending that to Elasticsearch, and the Elastic will not work with my data because the data was too fast. If I query the status, the service is down. It just crashed. And in QMB, it said I cannot connect to next request, which is in fact. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to then have that classic start again and see how we can improve that scenario. Let's wait again. Okay. Elastic is running, that's my, my statistics. Now I'm going to go to a firmware configuration and try to make it more friendly. I'm going to decrease the buffers and put an amount of memory. Uh, here, this is the key, memory limit. When you do the processing in a system, uh, you can send gigabytes to okay? But here, what we are saying, I'm going to take maximum 10 megabytes of data and don't consume more data until those 10 megabytes are flush. So we are running slow. If I run again and I go to see my elastic, I'm going to see how the data is going up. Probably. So we actually we generate some kind of black pressure to elastic, and now if we put some pressure of data, the amount of data that we ingest, elastic can work properly. But as you can see, that takes time. So if you want to perform some data analysis over that file using the traditional mechanism, uh, it will take some time. Okay, this is like half of the day. With that approach, that works. 
Okay, and as I said, with the last thing you can run your own queries, uh, calculate a reaction number, get your key fields, or do your own fancy dashboard with Kiban. The goal of this is not to demonstrate uh, why the last is failing, it's to demonstrate the concept of buffering and how it makes it takes time. Okay. This is a new problem that we have. Yeah, this is one record. That's fine. Ah, maybe the last look. Maybe the last uh, not like five doesn't have the record. Okay. Uh, let me do this. I'm not sure if this will work. No, I didn't. So, my favorite. It's one bit or less. You can do your own judgment. So, okay. So, the thing is that indexing took a lot of time here. Now, uh, imagine that I want to run some special secret queries over that thing. We wanted to do some queries over the data. So, here we're going to explain how. The simple uh, stream processing can work, and the thing that we have implemented. What you can see here, I'm going to open the video screen. Okay, and just modify this configuration so you can see what we are doing. What you can see there, it's just a, a simple query. We have two things. The first one is a select statement that select, select the IP, the country, from the stream, instead, where number is greater than A, and the country equals Brazil. So that is something that you need in a database to perform that query. And what we are doing with that, we are creating a new stream of data, which is called results. And why it's important sometimes to create a new stream of data. You can have many streams of data with different tasks, but sometimes you don't want to ship all your data. So you just create a new stream with results, but you just ship out the results. So this file is called streams, and I'm going to add it to, to a embed configuration. Streams files. Streams of code. Uh, no. Yeah, it's a way we need here. We don't need it. And we're going to send it, the data processing to the standard output. But just what belongs to results. Because we don't want to get double of record. Right? I'm going to speed up our flash now. That means the data will be, we have a small batches, but faster processing. So as you can see, I'm getting the data right away, and just the data that I really care about. You can, as Mato said in the morning, maybe for you, for your content, this can be real time. So we, need, we didn't need the, that indexing. Maybe you need it for other scenarios, but not here. So in logging on the edge stuff, you can do really good things. Yeah, and running is quite queries, but there's no database, there's no tables, it's kind of called schemaless or schema creation. So there's no there's no index, there's nothing. Everything runs in memory. And of course you can configure how you're going to process that. You can put limits so your memory don't go up, don't go up too much if you have too much data. That is one of the use cases. So the stream processor runs uh, after the storage phase that we got in the architecture uh, some minutes ago. So we got the data from the input for the files, the data was parsed, was filtered, and hit the storage. That's in the specific point where the stream processor runs. And on that moment, it decides if the data will be routed up, routed out to the, any output destination, like elastic standard output, or just ingest a new stream of data as part of the same pipeline, as part of the same input. And all of this is using SQL. We can uh, create uh, streams of data and also support data aggregation. Imagine that you have a hundred of sensors sending data 
it's your IoT environment. And you have two choices. What usually happens in production environments is that these devices, through a gateway, send all the data to the cloud. So if you have like 100 of samples of data per second, you are sending all that data to the cloud to perform these kind of queries. So why we don't avoid this and we do run this on the edge side? Uh, for example, imagine that we want to do some kind of uh, aggregation. I want to get all my records, well, Nooms Major 80, and the field is Brazil, but using aggregation. Are you familiar with aggregation, uh, SQL aggregation? So instead of run the queries on top of a, every record, just process all the records for a windows of time. For example, within the next 10 seconds, process all the records that match certain criteria. Let me show you this. Um, If you can see here, okay, we are creating a new stream of data and tagging that data with results. That is coming from this query where we select the country. We are counting how many records do we have. We calculate the average from the same data from a stream Linux step over a period of window of 10 seconds, where country equals Brazil, and we are grouping by the results. Uh, and I think that the logic for accomplishes is more complex. The otherwise, you will need to have your own, uh, your own stuff, your own database. So now we'll move to the configuration file for, for the streams. You can have many files with different string files. OK, categorization. So now it's running, but it's waiting for 10 seconds. During 10 seconds, it's listening for all the data that is coming in. And after that, it will just print out the results. So for everything that was country Brazil, the, the, the number of records processed, were 83,000, right? The average number of the field num was that one. So all of this is really important if you want to perform stream processing, and I think that there's no tooling available for that at the moment, besides this. And now uh, we have a few minutes. We're going to the internals, because I know that most of us are developers here. So we want to go deeper on how this works. OK, basically, we have a single engine. We're running a single process, running an event loop. Um, if we run on Linux, we use ePool. If you run in Mac OS, KQ, or in Windows, we are running with Live UV. It's a slower, but nobody will run no, this is stuff on Windows. It's just for the proof that it works. So basically, we have the input plugins. The, the output of the input plugins go to the filters. The filters ingest the data back into the engine, and the engine decides where to send the data out. But this is just one single thread. And what we do is, is fully asynchronous for any kind of IO operations. So and there's one important thing. Most of the plugins relies on network IO. If you're going to send data to a database, you need to create a TCP connection. If you're going to connect to a HTTP endpoint, you need TCP connection. Uh, are you familiar with Node.js? Or you heard about it, and you get scared? Yeah, the same thing. Have you heard about this concept, callbacks hell? People started creating asynchronous services or microservices and said, every time that I'm, getting some, I'm reading some data, please call this callback, a function. Every time that I can write data, go to this callback. And there's a problem. People started putting many callbacks inside callbacks, and it's a mess. It's called callback spaghetti or callbacks hell. So if we are implementing a kind of tool that is going to do a lot of I.O. asynchronous, how do we avoid that? And we come up with the design of uh, using coroutines. If you look carefully, an output plugin, this is the common task. For example, I'm, see, I'm going to ship data out. I'm going to create a connection, convert my message back to the format that the database is expecting. For example, Elasticsearch needs JSON. Kafka has its own format. Then 
After converting the data, I write the data over the network. Then I have to wait for a response. And then I say, um, I'm good, I'm OK. So if you look, look at this, this is like, uh, OK, we're going to block while waiting for connection, blocking while writing data, and so on. So all the red uh, letters here, it's where we, I'm wasting time. I'm wasting meaning I'm blocking, doing nothing. So our design comes with coroutines, where it said uh, for every I.O. operation, we're going to defer the task to the kernel and return back to our event loop. And once we get some data back, we're going to continue working. And all I.O. it works, uh, asynchronous I.O. Work, works with coroutine. So we can suspend the code at any point of view. So any point, I return control to the event loop. And when some event happens, we let the kernel to send us a signal and then resume from the last point. And uh, imagine, for example, this simple code. This is like a callback function, callback uh, for the plugin, not for the, the coroutines, which is called, this is Elasticsearch function. That, like this is a summary. So in line eight is where I'm getting a TCP connection. Line 14, I'm formatting my data from message pack to Elasticsearch. I create my HTTP client context, and then I perform the request, the HTTP request. So here is where I can take advantage of this, suspend and resume my, connect, so my, my ongoing work. So if you look carefully, you look at this code and you say, oh, this is quite trivial. But internally, when I hit, for example, line eight, hit that line, internally it's going to perform the connection, suspend and at the middle of the function, and do we continue processing, collecting data, and once the connection is done, we return and continue in the next line. So for you as a developer, this is pretty straightforward. And the same thing when writing the data to the server. We suspend and then we resume. And with this approach, we have a full asynchronous mechanism to send, to connect, send, and receive data. Uh, you can say that all well, this is like kind of Golang connectivity. Like, yeah, this is, this is like the old way how operating system used to work, right? They suspend from a function, they defer work to the kernel, or they return back to any place. And when it returns, it can say, it returns OK. I need to retry, maybe because the service was down, and you don't want to lose data. So what your login tool does is just reconnect after a few seconds of some jitter value. Or maybe you got an error that you cannot recover. Um, we have um, internal plugin helpers for connectivity, for timers, crypto. We support Lua. So thanks, Brazil, for that. And how do we use Lua? I'm going to explain now. We have input plugins for kernel messages, serial interface, systemd. So you can collect the data for many places. And also, you can write your output plugins in Golang. I prefer that you write it in C, but if you want to contribute in Go, that's fine too. And this is our filter in Lua. So one of the challenges that we got some time ago, if I have some minutes to explain the use case, uh, we were in Europe um, talking about the project. And people say, hey, we got this new GDPR, which is like a new European law about security, personal information. And we need to obfuscate the credit card transaction data. And we don't want to write a plugin in C for that, because it's pretty, it's pretty hard for them. So we come up with this solution. We implemented a filter called Lua that allows you to call Lua functions. And we handle all the records like a Lua table. What you see in a message pack is handled in Lua here. And the value that you return is how the record is transformed or reformed. Uh, integration with Prometheus, you can use its own HTTP endpoint to query metrics. And well, that's all. Thanks so much for coming. And if you have questions. So my question is re regarding the, the tags that you described. Uh, so the service can assign a tag for itself, or is those tags are uh, configured previously statically? Because I've seen that you can run on Docker. You can apply some logs and uh, connect to the Fluentd, specify where Fluentd is 
is actually located. But can you do this like dynamically to assign, okay, so each service, as you explained, a push, let's say, can assign a tag to itself and then we can storage or are those tags statically and you defined previously? Okay, how do we, how the tagging works? If you're sending data from Docker to FluentD or FluentBeb, that's one use case. And the Docker end and the Docker driver for FluentD or FluentBeb, it assigns its own tag, but you can modify it when starting your Docker service. Internally in FluentBeb, you can say everything that is going from this tail, you can say tag ABC. But the order, you can, you, you can assign tags manually if you want. The only one that you cannot assign tag is the forward protocol because tax comes from a predefined source. But for everything else, yeah, you can do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if you have more questions, ladies, during the pizza, beer time, feel free. <laughs>